Joust Punks, what's up, everybody? Thanks for tuning in. What's up, Fusamania? Oh, I, I just thought you did a great job on that introduction today. I'm practicing. I just practicing? look in the mirror. I look in the mirror and I'm like, let me let me practice today. You are awesome. You can do good. I like you. It's always that, that Ricky Smiley, the old <laughs> life skit. <laughs> I love myself. You did a great job. And um <laughs> This is Drew Pierce from Long Beach, <laughs> and I am Fusemania from Cincinnati, Ohio, and we are the Drew and Fuse Show. <laughs> it's so awkward. It. <laughs> it's, so, it's so good. Uh, we got uh, lots of things coming up. We're uh, going to be at Fusemania's wedding here in the Key West. This um, weekend. Yeah. This weekend. I, I'm hoping, well, this, this comes out the day after Mex, so... Okay. Um, so this yeah. past weekend. <laughs> so this, uh, this past weekend. And hopefully you were at the DMS party last night because it was nuts. I heard it was just crazy. People hanging off the, the rafters. And Dude, just, it was such just, a great party. I I, uh, I heard. <laughs> bonkers. I can't even tell you all the crazy stuff. So nuts. Because it happened so nuts. next week. <laughs> so nuts. Uh <laughs> That we're we're halfway between the now and and the future in this podcast, and you know there's a lot that's happened um, since uh, we had the Super Bowl and the Chiefs won, and that pains me a little bit as a Bengals fan to watch them win yet another one. Um, I don't have the hate for Taylor Swift like everybody seems to on the internet. I I think um, it's fun, you know. I like to see that she's up there partying just like a, a normal person. I think that's pretty cool. The Usher halftime show, thought that was fun. Thought it was good. Highly entertaining. Great. The roller yeah. skate thing was sweet. Little awesome. John in the crowd, like riding on people's shoulders, singing Turn Down for What was, was so awesome. Tight. Yeah. Um, and if you guys didn't know, if you use promo code Drew and Few Show, it'll get you 30% off your first month at directmusicservice.com. So it's pretty amazing as well. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of a big deal. <laughs> Drew's got nothing today. He's just he's just smile. He's just happy to be here today. <laughs> so, with that being said, uh, we'll, we'll just get into it. <laughs> well, well, we'll throw out our other. <laughs> I'm really excited for our guests. We've been chatting a little bit back uh, backstage, and I'm I'm pumped to jump into these stories. But don't forget, we got promo code. Um, from Crate Hackers, we have no promo code, but we are sponsored by them. <laughs> and, we have a promo code, but we don't have a promo code. <laughs> and they're awesome. They are awesome. Um, use go check out Crate Hackers, and we're going to talk about a bunch about music, and we do a hackathon for them once a month. Next month, we will be asking you guys to send in your playlists, and if you're brave enough. We're going to go through it and, you know, compliment or tell you to change stuff. So, you know, do that. It's this is it or this is shit. That's 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 the comment. That's going right. to be how it'll go. And uh, I like that. I like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, um, we did that. Uh, we perfect. We can get shirts that say that. Yeah, I um, like it. <laughs> we did the hackathon last month and it was fun. We were on there uh, chatting with everybody. If you guys haven't joined in, it's just a big kind of group discussion on music and everything. Uh, Drew and I gave away some edits, some exclusives. So um, it's another good reason to be in there if you're wanting some of that stuff. Um, and it's a chance to ask us questions live. With that being said, we got a great guest for today. Um, he's hailing in from Pittsburgh. He's a rep for Pioneer. Uh, he's been a long time DJ in the game. He's currently working on a documentary about DJing with Kevin Kerslake, who, if you guys didn't know, did the DJ AM doc. Um, 
It's called Revolutions, the story of a DJ. Uh, as well as being a longtime DJ himself, he's been on tour with De- uh, Jazzy Jeff and worked with Jeff a lot. Just very knowledgeable about DJing and the history of DJing and music in general. Please help us welcome DJ Zimmy. Hey, guys. <clears throat> what's, what's up, Hello, Zimmy? What's happening? What's I even happening? had uh, to, uh, to remind myself to, to say what after DJ Zimmy, but I forgot. <laughs> Yo, you guys can't see. Like, I'm off. When they were talking, I'm just in a little screen, like, off camera, but I was just laughing hysterically at <laughs> some of the, the segues and left turns. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> you were at a podcast at one point. We we've tried so hard to get a real opener, and it just tanks every time. It's it's uh, now it goes it into just the ground. Humanizes you guys. It's very professional. It's not like we're not on NPR here. This is you know. Oh, <laughs> uh, one day uh, maybe for that NPR uh, NPR spot. <laughs> They'll be like, Drew's calling in, and it'll be like, mm, 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 mm. <laughs> like also the NPR voice, just like, hey guys, I had a DJ question. Just, just put me know. right to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, seriously, thanks for taking the time to be on here with us today. We know you got a lot going on, and uh, my pleasure. And, thanks for having me. Yeah, we appreciate appreciate it big time. Um, kind of. You know, getting started, we were we were just kind of talking about you know our time at 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 Nam and all that, and um, if you kind of just want to tell us like your role there with Pioneer and kind of what what you were doing. Yeah, um, so I am artist relations for Pioneer DJ. I work on the open format side, uh, which is basically anything that isn't like four on the floor dance music, because um, Pioneer globally I think is very heavily on the dance side. Um, so I kind of manage hip hop, open format, um, battling, turntablism, anything, anything that's not just like, mm, mm, mm. Um, and, uh, last year, uh, I also do some product develop development with them, work on, uh, new products and ideas. So, uh, last year I just kind of worked the booth and was like at the scratch octagon and just like, you know, kind of managing the nerds over there this year, I kind of helped with the stage management side. So if you haven't been to Nam or haven't watched any of our videos on YouTube, um, we always have, um, performers, you know, big performers, DJs. Um, so I kind of helped with some of that stuff and yeah, just floating around the booth saying what's up to DJs, answering questions, you know, Nam is just a good place to kind of run into everyone you haven't seen in a while. And, you know, if I know someone needs something, I'll be like, yo, you're going to be at Nam. Yeah, just come find me and like, I'll just show you in person. So that yeah. scratch Octacon, uh, I'm sure like the first, you know, hour you're like, oh, this is cool. And then the rest of the, <laughs> the rest of it is uh, it's like being working at Guitar Center and just listen to people solo all day. Yeah. Uh, how do you That's survive? Literally it. Um, the biggest thing is it's so weird to me because, you know, last year. They were like, do we need anything for the booth? And I kind of wrote up like octagon etiquette cards, right? And they printed them out and they, and it's basically just like, take your turn, like let everyone kind of go, like don't adjust the volume, like all these things. And me coming up, like if I saw an octagon of some people scratching that I thought were pretty proficient and I, I maybe wasn't, or I didn't, I hadn't DJed at all. I don't know if I'd step up. And it's so funny because we get people that are like killing it. And then you get people that are literally like walked over from the piano department or just like, (laughs) and like, you know, they like the dude behind them was just like, like 90 click flare. And they're just like, and like five minutes later, they're still like, and everyone's like, it's just it's like a weird <laughs> like yo it's it, it's its own planet but you know we're happy to host it we had a couple cool moments where like there were like four girls on that were like all rocking and like you know like you get these like little moments that happen we had a lazy boy like buck rogers thing last year where like buck was on one side of a rev seven like doing beats and like lazy boy was cutting so you know you got it you got to get that out i always just tell people like hey man like you remember break dancers back in the day would like come to the club do their like five minutes and then go to the next club and like not ruin the dance floor for like three hours, which is kind of what they do now. (laughs) Just do that. Just come in, do your, and then be like, yo guys, I'm gonna go walk around. I'll be back. 
Guys stay there all day, like six hours. They got snacks. They're like, <laughs> I'm practicing. I don't even own gear. <laughs> wow. like, so, you notice people are like fighting to get in too. It's like they they think they're almost gonna get like their shot because they're scratching at the the pioneer. You know, it's so funny you mention that because one thing that definitely happened more this year that we noticed were because some of the stations are 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 all in ones like all in one controllers or CDJs we definitely noticed that people were showing up with their own thumb drive plugging in and like playing a set and like filming themselves like multi camera angle and then like posting it like That's... like i have like business cards like right here from people that were like <laughs> yo man thanks so much for like let me rock at your like Bro, you just got on and took over for like a half an hour. Like we didn't say anything. Like you were like full on in there. Like, and it it, it was definitely a thing this year. Like, try, like I'm no, I'm trying to get shows by like playing at the Pioneer booth. Like Pioneer um, DJ Alpha Theta. You know, I I had a question. Some uh, some people were asking me they were out of town and they were saying, do you feel that it's Nam has changed and that it, it used to be really for industry people and now that almost anybody can get in. It is a lot more of these people that are trying to, you know, just rub elbows, if you will. You know, it used to be more of a professional where people were actually going to buy or they were yeah. in the community that were like reporting on the new stuff. And now it's just the random kid that's like, oh, this is the spot where I can go meet Qbert, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I've been coming to NAM for for a long time, like um a long, a long time ago, I started with my homies at AGI Pro DJ, and I would come film content for them. I was there for a bunch of times with Jeff. Um, I definitely feel it change. Um, in some ways, it kind of seems like this is the problem. And this isn't a knock on Nam. This is just America. America is really good at figuring out how to squeeze every last dollar and out of everything. So not knowing the ins and outs of like all that i feel like it's definitely like you know booths are not cheap it's not cheap to be there as a brand so you're trying to maximize that attendees are trying to like you know i mean it's it is an industry trade show so you're trying to like do what you got to do and give out business cards and shake hands so i can't begrudge anybody for that um but also like the basement isn't there anymore i don't know if you've ever been to the basement but the basement is where like a dude that builds weird guitar pedals in his basement yes, would be able to like yes. afford a booth. So I think it just needs a little bit of balance of like, yeah, you've got this massive booth that looks like a space station, but you've also got weird dude who builds turntable violins in his basement. And like, you can go down there and, and you know, the basement is where I saw it was a, a DJ booth and they would project it and you could DJ. I don't know how it would, you could DJ. It was like projection mapped on onto this uh, plexiglass and you could DJ on top of the, the plexi. I saw that down like at Tron. The, yeah. At I mean, we, was crazy. yo, like we had that at our booth this year. We had tribe XR, like you could DJ like virtual reality, like the first performer we had, there was no gear. And I was like, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, I mean that it's always cool to see the stuff. It's just, you know, yeah, you got to balance like regular people, industry people. I don't, I don't know if they have like a outreach program where they're like going out to like, hey man, we know you guys have a podcast. We want to make sure you're sorted so you can come see everything. Like, I don't know if they do that. Like, I don't, I don't work for Nam, but I mean, you know, I just like to see everyone. I just like the fact that I can stand in the booth and twenty times a day, one of my homies will come in. I'm like, yo, yeah, come up from Arizona. How you doing? I, I love that as well. I like that anybody can get in. I'm just wondering if it's, uh, you know, hurts the, you know, the people that actually need to get through and talk to Pioneer about buying something or have a real question. So, yeah, I definitely get a lot of business cards like, hey, man, I, you know, I, some people, I, and I try to help everyone. Like, if you're starting a business and you're trying to get in touch with one of our sales guys, I will pass it off. But also, yeah, we just get some some people that I know. I'm like, I'm gonna do my boss a favor and not not ever tell him <laughs> you're looking for him because you're crazy. I, as my first time, one of the things, and I don't mean this in a mean way, but I just feel like the whole show is like very California, you know, like in terms of like there's just it's expensive. That's this the subtitle at the bottom of the screen needs to be live from Cincinnati. But go ahead. <laughs> well. 
we go to dude we go to djx and i think djx is probably more expensive for us because you got to fly in well get a car do the is, bit it's more expensive because flying into atlantic city isn't easy right that's yeah like, that's the other thing djx is a whole other beast like you either have to fly to philly and take a train fly to new york and take a bus like it's like not really it, it's just kind of a weird one and it's like a little bit of a different and it's only dj and it's kind of like a little bit more on the mobile and wedding side and yeah so anyway sorry you were saying nam is too hollywood or something it's very much like a like a, a who's who kind of event at the same time i feel like i feel like there's just so many djs there from specifically that area which why wouldn't there be I mean, yo, if I could drive down, I would. I got to fly across the country, you know? <laughs> right, right. Well, it's only 20 minutes from my house. And I, that's what I love about NAM is, um, I, you know, I do think there are a lot of California DJs. You know, that's what I, I can see how you would think that. And it is harder to get to. You're not. That's why more people from California will come. But that's also how I feel when I go to X that I feel that it's all East Coast guys and there's nobody from California. New Jersey. It's a cool event. I I very much enjoyed it. And like we were talking about off camera, like I was only there for a day, but I would really like to go back again and kind of just see all the other things um, besides like the whole DJ wing of the show. Yeah. I mean, if you, so if you're watching this and you've never been to NAMM, just to give you like a little intro, it's a music trade show and it's, it's not just DJ it's pro audio guitar you know brass instruments staging lighting sound companies if you make guitar picks if you make yeah. violin tuning heads like everyone has a booth so djs are djs always ruin the party for everyone <laughs> like, <laughs> like the beastie boys so you know we have our own little hub that's like just dj performances all day and all those dj centric brands but there's a lot of people that come from other countries that come from around the country that are, you know, the work for Sweetwater or your big buyers. And like, they're there for meetings. They're getting the demos of the new products. You know, you have, you have people that are there like straight up. I don't want to say spying, but they're literally like, yo, we're trying to make speakers and we're going around all the speakers and, you know, like, so it's, but it's cool. And, you know, the thing that um, Fuse and I were talking about beforehand is like, everyone has these sponsored artists. So like the first time I went, I remember walking by like a drum booth and like Bernard Purdy's in there playing because he was sponsored by the company. And like, you know, they said, hey, man, can you come do like 20 minutes? Like Stevie Wonders walking around and then he performed like right next to the Corey Alpha Feldman Theta was there. Pioneer DJ Corey booth, you know, like, <laughs> yo, it's like so, you know, you can definitely see cats like I'm walking by and Butch Vig is talking about how to record vocalists. And you're just like, what? But it's just a cool it's, it's something cool to check out. There's there's panels that happen where people walk you through music related and industry related stuff. I mean, depending on what you're there for, like you can definitely get a lot out of it. You can, you can meet a lot of people. You can see a lot of things, you know, also there's just shows at night, like parties. And, you know, I got to go to some cool parties while, when I was out there just for that week, you know, so. I, yeah, it was awesome. And, you know, to kind of segue this, one of the things that, you know, we were talking to you about at NAM is uh, you got the, the documentary going on with uh, Kevin Kerslake. And um, do you kind of want to tell us a little bit about that and where that's at and yeah. you know, what's going on with it? So uh, if you have been following me at all, um, you've been hearing me talk about working on a DJ documentary for my adult life. Kevin I and I, to it. <laughs> I think yeah, I I to it's, the beginning. it's, it's like, so weird because we kind of got to a place where like we started pitching during COVID, which is the worst time ever to pitch something. I could make a documentary about us pitching because it was like, all right, we're ready to go out and literally COVID hit. And like, and like two months go by and the agent was like, okay, we got some more meetings. And then like, I don't remember the exact order. It was like Kobe Bryant died, which is, which is crazy because like in LA, people are literally like, we're just not handling business right now. We're just, we're just taking a break. And we're like, okay, cool. And then like we get up and running again and it's like George Floyd. And we're like, okay, cool. We're just taking a break. And then it was like, California wildfires. And like, we're just like, we're just like, this is kind of weird. So we've, we've just been working in the background and, and doing what we need to do. And, um, you know, last year, August 11th was the celebration of hip hop 50th. So I had pitched a pioneer, you know, we, we, we'd love to create some, some content for you guys, something around that. So, uh, Kevin and I are working on a three-part docuseries about 
um, the DJ's role in the last 50 years of hip hop, you know, being at the center of that. So there's a teaser out on uh, the Pioneer DJ Instagram on mine. Um, and we're about to this month release the first episode. It's a three part series. But um, yeah, like got some got some real good interviews, got some real juicy bits and uh, and all that stuff, too, is now you know accessible to us for the larger project. So um, look for that. And if you're watching this and you're like dad works at HBO, call me because I got <laughs> it's crazy because like we have so much stuff. Curse Lake has all the AM stuff. Right. Uh, use it in Somniac well, for like 10 years. Like we have like the gold. Curse Lake also shit. did every one of my favorite like 90s music videos ever. You know, Yo, it was it's so funny. Nuts. It's so funny. I think my friends are sick of me saying it, but we'll be driving around and like Alice and Chains will come on and I'll be like, Curse Lake did this video. And then like <laughs> Smashing Pumpkins, <laughs> Curse Lake did this video. Yeah. Like literally, the the visual landscape of your '90s rock childhood was yeah. Curse Lake. Helmet. So I, I Nirvana talked about and this. Bloom. <laughs> like, hey man, nice shot. Yeah. Like literally, like there's. I'm just like, I'll I'll hear a song and go. I bet you Curse Lake did this video. Curse Lake did the video. Like the dudes, yeah. like the Joan Jet doc, the Bob Marley doc. Like the dudes got his resume is just like bonkers. So, I mean, it's, it's been great working with him. He's just a legend and learning all this stuff. And, and also just talking to DJs. Like I love talking to DJs. I love hearing these stories. Like, you know, that's it. So it, I'm, I'm just, I will work on this until it happens. I don't care if I have to just like, I'm going to be 82. It'll be like Queens, Queens Gambit. I don't know if you guys know that story. Like <laughs> yeah, it'll yeah. come out one day. So I just too. We, I was mentioned on off camera, and I wanted to say that you know I watched the the trailer that went out. It looked awesome. All the the footage looked uh, great, and you know we mentioned Mr. Dibs, and I'm from Cincy. He's from Cincy, and uh, I I think that's cool. I don't really know much about him personally, so uh, yeah. Know, I think um, Dibs is awesome. Um, if you're watching this and you don't know who Mr. Dibs is, I mean I don't want to give you his whole bio, and also I'll probably forget something. But um, Dibs is one of the guys behind Scribble Jam, which was a very seminal uh, Midwest hip hop festival, DJ battles, um, MC battles. I mean, you know, Eminem was there early on. That's like the rumor about he got like discovered there. I mean, there's stories, you know, graffiti stuff. It was like all of that in the Midwest. Um, scratch bastards star wars routine that's from scribble jam so like it's just oh, this wild. like legendary uh festival that happened and you know dibs dibs is just a beast uh i got last year to go see dibs um breakbeat lou with souls of mischief atmosphere um all these people at a large professor was there at red rocks and he he makes what what you he was calls turntable music which if you hear it you know, it's like really nasty beats and stuff you can scratch over and it's really cool. And there's, there's always like a good visual component, but you know, the dude's a beast on the turntables and the the best example, like if I was going to tell you to check out Mr. Dibs, um, when run the jewels four came out, he did what's called a destructo mix. So they gave him the whole album and all the parts. And he made this like 10 minute mix of death as like promo for the album, but that'll give you like a really great insight into just like what this dude does. So, you know, like his Instagram is wild. He just makes these little like clips that are almost like he's like scoring like horror movies or something, you know, and like he's just a really talented dude and hanging out in Cincinnati and, you know. How is it for you? Like just I feel like it would almost be like overwhelming taking all this this knowledge and footage in of people like how do you how do you manage it, you know, like to to tell the story, you know? <sighs> Well, first off, I'm pretty OCD, which is like a gift and a curse. So like I'll be very organized, but it comes at the expense of my sanity sometimes. Like um, this this particular project was good because it had a narrow enough scope that I was focused on hip hop, battling, you know, things like that. So it wasn't the larger project is like pirate radio and like rave and like every like Jamaican sound systems, like everything. So this allowed me a little bit of a narrow lane of focus. Um, and also I'm just really passionate about storytelling and historical storytelling. So I want to make sure that like, you know, we're nerds, but somebody watching this who just got into DJing and is 25 or doesn't DJ at all, can watch it and go, 
oh my God, here's the connection points. D nice that I follow on club quarantine used to be in boogie down productions. And here's the path of da, 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 da. And just kind of like making that making sense out of it because it's all still relevant. Like so many people that are big figures today, you know, your Dr. Dre's, I mean, Dr. Dre's had a career since what is it? 50 years, 1983 yeah. world-class wrecking crew. Like some of these people like, so yeah, that's, I think the 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 management of the information and the story just comes from a place of like I just want to tell the story. I'm just passionate about it. You know, I care, and uh, I think it's important. And I think you know this is there's reasons why we do what we do. And I think we have a DJs have a historical significance. You know, if I'm being completely honest, I mean, you know, I was gonna say I'm, I'm hyped on this project. That actually the scope project because when I first got into DJing, I was in there was this. Uh, documentary i know z trip is that in on at the end of it where he shows his collection off i don't remember it's uh, talking about scratch. scratch yeah Doug Prey, and remember, yeah and i remember watching that and just you know picking up even like just so many little things because you know it was pre-internet i'm trying to learn anything i can about you know setting my needles to the side or whatever i got to do just just crazy stuff um so you have all of this pre-stuff you're doing the the wider scope do you start incorporating some of that? This part, this Pioneer project, I'm probably like a little over 50 interviews in. And if stuff comes up, like we're editing now, but if stuff comes up, I'll, I'll happily, like I definitely, there's some people we just had schedule conflicts or like Hip Hop 50, there was a lot of touring that was really crazy. So like locking in certain people was tough, but I have like a bunch of interviews from before and like, so not, not everybody, but I mean, some of that is just literally cost prohibitive until someone's like, Hey, do you need to go to London for a month and film? You know, I saw you. Did you have a Fat Boy Slim shirt on in the opening? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Is that I did, yeah. Was that like a new one? It's a new, it's a newer one. Yeah, yeah. So, like, you know, I'd love to talk to Norman Cook, but like, I'm not gonna fly over there on my dime unless like it needs to get cut into something right now. So, yeah, I'm sorry. What was the question? I just like fucking ramble. Well, back. I'm saying, are you using some of the stuff from the wider scope? Um, depending on the, you know, story and quality, because the crazy thing is quality right now, like we're shooting stuff in 8k. So right. it's really got to match. Like if I watch an interview and I'm like, I can pull a couple things out and it looks good. Absolutely. Um, you know, and, and, and I'm just, I kind of wrote the story and kind of mapped it out a little bit differently for this one than some of the long form interviews I did before that were just like general, you know? So. Yeah, and that was going to be my question: is as time grows and as things change, how much are you able to? How how do you categorize it? Like Fuse asked, and then how do you? How are you able to? Um, if any of it gets old, do you have to reshoot it or any of that? Yeah, I mean, look, I always like a fresh reshoot because I always know more about a person and DJing, and things change and quality, camera quality, and things look better. But I also have interviews with people that I think have passed away. That that's what it is, but. I think people people are a lot more forgiving if it's interesting, right? We also oh, live in a time where I, I like everything to be crispy in 4K. I also watch people watch things on their phone, and I'm like, you're watching Avatar on your phone, so I don't know if you care that much. You know? Right? It's a it's a weird it's we're in a weird spot. One of the things I wanted to ask you with with talking to so many DJs and you know just kind of kind of seeing where we're at in DJ in the DJ world now and how many, how, how so much has changed. Like, where do you think DJing will be in another 10 years? And this is your opinion. So say whatever you want and whatever you feel where, you know, I thought I've been thinking about this a lot. Um, Cause there's a section in this, in this series where we talk about the future and, and to jump around a little bit, about a decade ago, I don't know if you guys remember. I wrote I wrote an article called "The End of DJing." I remember that it was very all over Twitter. I, I love yeah. That. So I'm right. I'm redoing my website right now, and I'm I'm in the draft of the follow up to that with what's happened over the last decade. So I've been thinking a lot about the future, and you know, on one hand, I'm very hopeful because I work with people like the Beat Junkies. Right, the Beat Junkie School is phenomenal. Right, they have an online course; it's amazing. They have an in-person school that's amazing. You know, you're learning from like some of the best to ever do it. And I've and I've witnessed their students. Like I'm at DMC battles, and there's 14 year old girls just destroying grown ass men, and it's like awesome, right? So I know I know the information is there. 
you know, there's a lot of interviews we did where people were like, bro, I would just wait for my boy to mail me a dub of like a cassette from the East coast to learn how to like to watch a battle. So the information is there, which makes me hopeful that like, if you want to learn something, it's really just up to you. Right? Like, so on the other hand, I definitely also see like a ton of laziness, a ton of entitlement and DJing is very weird. DJing is very weird right now. Like, like I'm not talking about like part of the service industry. I get to go play my Friday night at the club. And like, I just got to get through my gig. Like I'm just, you know, the ice machine tonight. Um, <laughs> never heard of that term, but well, I mean, you know, talking to Graham funky, he's like, I'm no more or less important than the ice machine. The ice machine breaks. There's no party. He goes, if I break, there's no party. He goes, we're just, we're all like part of a machine. I'm just a cog that's in a machine. So I try to really under like the other problem is we age. So I try to understand the, the, the vibe of people going out and the zeitgeist of all that being someone who doesn't want to go out. Like I, I absolutely love to go to a party. If I think it's going to be a quality time, well spent and all that I'll pay top dollar. But most of the time going out is pretty horrible to me. I'm also a grown ass man. Um, where do I think DJ is going to go? I'm really interested to see what happens. I'm very intrigued by routines. And I don't know how you guys feel about this particular topic, but watching watching three style turn into a form of DJing and then watching the internet allow people who've never DJed to just post routines and then gain notoriety because I have friends that own venues and they're like, DJs come in and they're like, yo, I want to play here. And they're like, looking at the page and they're like, have you ever played anywhere? And they're like, no. <laughs> and then, they, <laughs> you know, and they've got a million TikTok followers and they book them and they can't get through a night because they're just trying to put routines together to make like two hours. Right. So right. I'm, I'm uh, but I'm, I'm also very cognizant that like, are we going to get to the point where every mix in an hour set is a routine? <laughs> and it's just, I'm just, it's just, it's weird to me sometimes. Like I go out and I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to just back up a little bit because I was talking about the end of DJing and, and the, and the, the precursor of that whole story is when a lot of OGs retire, there's going to be a pretty big gap. And I, and I really still believe that. So go to Nam, cut chemist hits me and he goes, yo man, shout out cut chemist hits me and goes, Yo, we're doing this party up at the lodge, me and Shortcut and Edan. I'm like, that sounds like a dream lineup. If you're if you're at home and you don't know Cut Chemist, Shortcut, and Edan, please familiarize yourself. So I go up, I meet Kilmore, I'm with Spark from Pioneer, a couple other people. It was the most inspiring DJ night I've had in like five years at least. Right. Edan's opening, playing vinyl clean clean mixes one point he starts rocking doubles with one hand and rapping rapping All on the vinyl. mic and rocking doubles and i don't mean sloppily i mean you would have thought he was using two hands and headphones and we're on the side of the stage like what so then cut chemist gets on and they got their visuals guy exp tv he's like doing the coolest visuals and cut is cut cuts doing his thing and the best way I can describe it to someone is like, it's just like masterclass level skills with like creativity, playing cool shit, freaking it like as needed, not really routines, but just like actual ability goes and starts doing the loop pedal shit with the records and like building vinyl loops. And like, we're like losing our mind. Charlie tuna comes out and raps. Then Charlie tuna starts DJing and cut chemist is rapping. Uh. Well, I'm like, I don't know what's going, the crowd's going insane. And then Shortcut gets on and they start going back and forth and just off the dome are doing a Beastie Boys sample set. Just, wow. just running through like building Paul's boutique songs from scratch. And like, I'm losing my mind. And then they're just, you know, and I just went home and was like, I don't see that anymore because there's a world of difference between like, I sat here for an hour and I figured out how to make the Mighty Mouse theme song into Ski Yee. 
And <laughs> I'm just uniquely creative because all of that stuff came from pre-internet, like we talked about. I have to figure out how to do the thing without watching the YouTube video. And I came up with my own unique style, which is why all those OGs have these like little, there's all the beat junkies have their own flavor. They're all great. They're just like, you're funky like this and you're good at that, you know? So not, not to be old man here, but basically like I go to those nights and then I go, is this going to happen in 10 years? Will I see like a group of people that are now 30 who are doing things at that level where I'm like inspired and impressed? I, I don't know. I don't have it, but yeah, that's just, I, I, wa I watch people and I'm just like, you know, there's all these videos where like someone mixes two songs together and, and they're like, oh, and then this happened. And I'm like, yo, you should be embarrassed. This is, this is the dumbest shit I ever saw. Like I can't even, the internet is wild right now. Yeah. I'm 36. So I kind of came up like after the hip hop stuff, there's a lot of like hip hop stuff that I like still, but I was, you know, kind of, I'm in a weird age group. I feel like even for like DJing, but I also feel like my age of people are kind of the last ones that like take it really serious. You know, you know, everything that I play, I pretty much edit. And I would say like, that's what is my uniqueness. That's what sets me apart is that I'm going to play something different than, than somebody else. And I know exactly what you're saying when you're saying all that, because I hear a lot of young guys play and I'm just like, what, what is, what is, there's nothing that makes this unique at all or, well, it's even, like even just some of the basic <laughs> fundamentals of DJing that people will tell you today don't matter. Programming, and you know, this is a Kevin Scott conversation. Kevin was like, I could never do crazy cuts. I could never do this. But I knew how to pick the right song to play next forever. Forever. I, you just put me somewhere. I will read the crowd. And that is a valuable skill and that requires musical knowledge and paying attention and like preparation. Right. But even that just goes out the window because it's almost like now the goal is I've got some ideas that I'm going to try to get off whether or not, whether or not they're appropriate for what's happening out there on the floor. Like I'm going to scoodly doodly do, you yeah. know, in, instead of just letting that shit breathe for another verse. And like you watch people and I'm like, dog, look, look up, look up right now. Like look at right. the crowd. Like, just let that well, shit play for another verse. The girls are loving it. Scootily doodly doo. You know, like. Uh, I I want to add to this. I, I feel that what Fuse was saying is valid and what you're saying is valid. The old, the old guys have definitely paved the way. And everybody's, you know, once they, they graduate, who is next, right? Then we have this phase of everyone that was in EDM. And, you know, the EDM guys the the edm djs currently they grew up watching the zeds and the the people doing air hearts and now we have this new phase where we're at nam and i'm watching everybody that went through the beat junkie school and i'm going how does that girl even know that song like this little teenage kid that knows the song so i don't know that it's completely dead i feel that you know pioneer releasing a turntable and knowing that that's needed and because there was a time at nam that it was only about controllers there was no turntables and that's not happening anymore. It's actually coming back to the turntable and coming back to the performance. So yes, the, the routines are never going to go away because that's the viral moment. Right. But mm -hmm. once you get people in front of a crowd and everybody leaves, that person's going to have to grow and evolve and learn, Hey, I need to know how to keep these people here. So it's a two way. I, I, I still like, think it's coming. The, the other part of the coin is, and I'm not saying like DJing is going to fall apart. I just, I look at the fundamental foundational stuff and like you can make a routine out of any song. That's look, if you give someone a song and say, sit here until you come up with something, you'll get some tone play or some looping or something. And it's not, it's more clever than anything else. And it's just how much time do you want to devote to making ski -yi into the other thing, right? The th other side of the coin is public attention spans keep shortening to the point where putting your phone down and just going and hearing a DJ and dancing and interacting with people is so rare. I think that's also kind of the driving force. They need to be entertained with a little performance thing every 90 seconds or they're bored and it's just you know 
I, the thing that drives me nuts though, with a lot of the younger guys too, is like with the programming and stuff, it's like how we're getting to the next song too. It's like, there's no care on how it sounds. Uh, Graham and Stone said it best once in an interview where they were like, how do you hear what I'm doing and then hear what you're doing and think that we're all doing the same thing because we're not, you know? Well, and (sighs) these are opinions. Everyone has an opinion. You agreeing with me doesn't make me right. And you disagreeing doesn't make me wrong. And I have my preferences of what I want out of a DJ night also, but I look at people that are widely considered as masterful DJs. And I just kind of, you know, I look at how diverse their crates are and how much knowledge they have. And I guess the things they prioritize and you can always sprinkle some stuff on top, but at the end of the day, like knowing the tracks, reading the room, you know, the nostalgia stuff is really big right now, the eighties and nineties and the R and B and like the jiggy rap and stuff. Those it's really big, but you know, and I don't know, if you guys can hear when someone knows what music to play, but not how to play it. Like you hear like, Oh, you got all the R and B joints. Like you downloaded the playlist and you know, like, <laughs> Oh, you ever, you're supposed to play the break at the end. That's the sing along. And you can hear them. Like they don't know that because they didn't grow up with it, but it's like, just listen to someone else or like listen to the track the whole way through and go like, Oh shit. I'm going to, fl- I mean, flip this and start there. And, you know, and that was, I tell this story all the time. Um, DJ Crooked. When I started booking DJs, when me and Nugget started booking DJs in Pittsburgh, um, we were bringing in guys from Vegas and guys from LA, Dexter guys. And Crooked was one of the first guys, you know, everyone, this is when uh, Crooklyn clan and some of the early edit stuff was happening. We just didn't have those songs. Like it was very secretive. Like, yo, you have the song I want to play, but you have a version with fat man scoop. And like, I don't know what this is. And Crooked was the first guy. And I don't know if there's just New York or what, he would play the songs we all had and he played them different. Like he would yeah. bring in a song. I'm like, Oh, he's going to play Billy Jean. And he would bring it in at a really interesting part and then like flip it to the top. And I'm like, you can do that with any record. You just have to listen to it and be like, this is what would work best for the crowd. And you know, like, sure. That's probably an early version of a routine, but no, it's knowing the records. It's like, I don't know, you know, I mean, whatever. I'm it's, it's very <laughs> tough to wade into old man waters when like, you're not going with the status quo. So I just try to be like, yo, everything's cool. I just have my preferences. So Super Bowl for uh Usher and Alicia Keys, they did the very ending of that, right? They she played her part and then they just did the, the sing along part, you know, the big the big end and then brought it back. And I thought yeah. it was it was good. I mean, they they know the parts that everyone like. I yeah, it is just going out there and it's like being a comedian and testing jokes. Uh, yeah. You gotta get out and You'd be in the clubs and it's just run the tracks. I'm happy that I did the bulk of my DJing and club DJing at a time where like, number one, I think the music was better. That's just, that's my opinion. Everyone's going to have their own opinion, but like early two thousands, the, the Neptunes and Lil John and Dr. Dre. And like, those guys were like battling for like club hits and the music was great. And it was fun because you were also going back like, yo, you could throw eighties in, I could throw a disco record in, People had kind of those ears still. People were dancing. Cell phones weren't like, like, you know, you had a cell phone, but that shit was Nokia, you know, (laughs) 700. Like, you weren't doing shit in the club on a cell phone. You were at the club, like, trying to talk to a girl or, like, talking to your your homies or drinking or whatever. You were dancing. So it was, like, just, it's, it's just a different, you know, it is what it is. Like, I'm not trying to go forward or backward in time, but I'm just happy that I did certain things when, you know, I could run that Justin Timberlake B side that hadn't come out yet. And people were like, Oh, this is, this is cool. I know this is Justin Timberlake. I don't know what this is. I'm going to keep dancing, you know? Right. Mm-hmm. So. I, I actually feel that with the TikTok, it's bringing us back to some of that stuff. Cause it's reintroducing. Um, that, that's just my opinion. I feel that people know some more. Also random playing songs. At one of the cool venues right now. So he's got that going for him where he gets to play cool music at a cool uh, venue that doesn't, uh, want people to take requests and actually wants the DJ to be a DJ. That's, I mean, look, I've been, I've, I've been fortunate enough to really hear some great sets recently. Like I was at art Basel. Um, I got to hear Bastard's barbecue, like a whole slew of, of G's um, Dante's hi-fi. I got to hear some killer sets on vinyl and like very much parties where people are there for like, I'm here for what you want to play. You're the DJ. I trust you. Like, it's it's just nice and also i'm like 
I'm nerding out. I'm like, what the fuck is this? What is that? Right. Like, yo, like yeah. I want to come hear your set and leave and be like, I don't know what half the shit you played was and the whole set was fire. Like you can you can train wreck every mix for all I care because you can fix that later. You can learn that skill. But I want to hear some like, yo, like I have a couple of friends who will call themselves SoundCloud hoes and they're just like, oh, I'm just on here finding like the gems, you know what I mean? So, <laughs> I, I wanted to, when you brought up the cut chemist party, uh, actually one of my questions was going to be, um, you know, you say you want to see this and all this. It does come down to how do you make money doing these parties, right? Uh, like the cut chemist one is like yes it's amazing and we're all there but they got to make money and mm -hmm. you know the venue's got to make money so how do you you know do that party and make money and i think you're saying it is you do got to throw your own party and you got to basically get the right selectors and you got to get the people that are going to go there and you know want to be um yeah. i mean look at the end of the day you know Twitch during COVID was really interesting because a lot of people kind of got pseudo discovered people that had really great taste and skills and things right. like that. And it gave them the hall pass to play what they wanted. And people went, Oh, I fucked with this. Like I talked to right. Cutso and he was like, how am I supposed to go back to playing in the club? I'm playing Portis head on like live streams and people are like into it, you know? So that was, a, that was an interesting preview into, you know, gas lamp killer has airplane mode. And there's some of these like, parties where you kind of lock up your cell phone i mean i think there's there's enough out there for everyone we don't all have to play the same records you don't have to play it the same way read the crowd sometimes just letting that extra verse go is exactly what you need to do at that moment sometimes it's not you know i don't know take up take chances go left field you know Mm -hmm. i love the idea of the uh the party without the cell phone i think that's amazing uh people go bottle service killed the club. And I don't think that at all. I think the cell phone killed the club is really what I think. And I think, you know, bottle service and celebrities stop going out to bottle service clubs because of cell phones. You know, you can't have a good time when it, everything you do is being recorded. But we saw, uh, <laughs> we saw Jack white and uh, his show. He, he, he made you lock up your, your phone and it was awesome. It was, yeah, it was I mean, all the comedians that kind of started started doing that for their shows all said it's a different experience. Like the crowd is, it, you know, you get that initial 10, 15 minutes of like, I'm uncomfortable. I don't have my phone. But then your brain resets and focuses and you're locked into the, you know, the comedians were like, they're, they're looking at you. They're not filming you. They're engaged. They're not checking their right. phone. Like they they're getting the whole joke and because you know comedy is a really good example where every line matters and the timing matters so if you look at your phone and read a sentence and miss a key line you just miss the whole joke it makes perfect sense and djing is the same way like your body's your body's trying to get out of work mode and all the bullshit that's going on in your life and have a party quit checking what's going on at every other party it's like I love talking to young people that like really young people that were like, when you, so you didn't have a phone, like how did you, and you explain to them, like going to the mall and meeting your friends and like their brain can't handle you. You just had to trust that your friend would be there at seven o'clock. And I was like, yeah. And you waited. And after was, a while, if he wasn't there, <laughs> you thought there was a problem and you might like go call his house. It was a, it was, a, but your brain was just, you know, this is what we're doing now. When her dad might answer for the first time, you're like, oh, God, I want to call. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hello? Click. Yeah. That, you know, that, I mean, there is psychology behind all this stuff, too. It's not just me being like, get off your phone and don't show me your request. It's like, if you just put your phone away and, and had a drink in 30 minutes, you'll be so locked into the dance floor. At the end of the night, you'll be like, thank you. Thank you for this. Well, Versus like. I've never heard airplane mode, but uh, that sounds like an amazing party. And that Jack White thing that we went and saw, uh, I, I'm i not the biggest Jack White fan. I don't dislike Jack White at all. I like, you know, there are a lot of the uh, White Stripes hits, but like his solo stuff, I don't really know. And I ended up, that was one of my favorite shows I saw that year. It was awesome. Right. It was Same. Completely like, amazing. I I enjoy him, but just the being engaged in the entire show is yeah. what made it awesome. You can, and you can tell, I mean, if you're watching a movie at home and you just look at your phone every once in a while, you start kind of, you're drifting and you're not focused. It's like, just completely just focus on whatever you're doing. You know what I mean? I don't mm -hmm. know. I, I'm guilty of it too, but 
the, the times where I'm actually like, you know what, I'm putting my phone away from this. I'm going to do this. It's, I always end up enjoying everything that I do more because of that. We're on, we're looking at screens way too much all day. Anyways, as I talk to you guys on the screen, I know. <laughs> <laughs> this is a combo. This is, this is while it's all been, you know, there's all the bad things. This has been one of the great things though, that came out of it all too, because I'm like, why, yeah, why weren't we just connecting with people in this way? It's like, we have this tool now to communicate, you know, where I'm in Cincy, you're in Pittsburgh, Drew's in Long Beach. And it's like, now we're having this conversation, you know, and it's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things we, you know, we wanted to talk about um, with you was kind of your time working and traveling with Jazzy Jeff and kind of just maybe even some travel tips in general. We do have a segment video for this one as well. So I will roll that. And then we'll get into I hope it. Whoever's in it is wearing a shirt, but go ahead. <laughs> Great Scott! Hey there, Drew and Fuse! It's me, Doc Brown. Quick, jump in the DeLorean. We need to get this episode up to 88 miles per hour. Now, hit the flux capacitor. And let's travel to the future. Wow. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> um, do you just want me to like ramble them off or is there like a line? No, of we actually here? do have some questions. We have some questions. <laughs> okay. All right. So you uh for a while were traveling constantly for work uh you were jazzy jeff's uh, tour manager um i want to know what uh a tour manager or whatever your specific job does you book in flights um or are you just setting up the gear like like is it all encompassing Do, like if someone wanted this job right is it just you know everyone does something different or what is it you kind say of you do here um <laughs> Yeah, so so the specific uh, scope of work for a tour manager depends on who you're working for and like what gets negotiated. Um, some organizations you're going to do a lot more stuff. Some organizations where the artist is bigger, there might be multiple tour managers. They might handle like very specific lanes. Um, I did not book any of the travel. I can tell you right now for anybody, if you're looking to get into anything that involves touring and logistics, just hire a travel agent because the other thing that's going to happen, number one, they can negotiate like way better prices. But the other thing that's going to happen is you're going to have problems on the road. And then instead of you trying to call airline and just sit there and hate your life, you call the person and they got up they, they have like direct backline numbers to everyone. So um, I wasn't personally doing that. Basically, I would advance, advance, did you advance that? I would advance uh, tech. Hey, we're coming in. This is your point of contact. This is the gear we need for the show. Um, can you give me all the necessary, like, you know, you'll have the names of the people you're going to liaise with, et cetera, et cetera. All the times, information about the show, advance a graphics package, like all of that stuff. Um, and then when the actual tour comes and it's laid out and, you know, we know, okay, we're going out for a month, we're doing 20 shows or whatever. Yeah. It's basically just, I don't want to say adult babysitting, but it's like getting people on the plane, making sure the luggage all gets where it needs to go, check in hotels, check in, check out, you know, sometimes there's like, yo, I got to, you know, and I was doing tech stuff for Jeff also. So it was like, yo, I'm going to run to the club by myself in the afternoon and do the sound check and make sure we're all good. Get back whatever else needs done i mean there's no yeah there's uh, obviously i, I want to backtrack for one second yeah. um you mentioned sending out a, a graphics pack right and this is all done pre-advanced but i'm guessing most people once you get there probably don't have it or fucked up somehow uh 198 of the time <laughs> is there uh i i you know, I go to places and I'll play on an LED wall. What's something that you should have constantly on you? I'm just saying as a tip. Yeah, uh, the biggest thing is just have your all your shit in like Dropbox or something. So basically, like you've got your logo. Not even a USB. Like you, you just yeah. tell them to yeah. log on to your Dropbox. Get okay. So get get the USB that's got the C and the A. Get that one because that's you. You don't know what someone's using. 
and having your Dropbox, your logo in transparent format, like a couple different versions, black background, white background, all the basic stuff. And then, you know, if you want to make little 15 second, 30 second video loops, things like that, because depending on you're going to get somewhere and they're going to put your logo up and be like logo and it's done. You're going to get somewhere else and you're going to have like mega nerd who's going to be like doing all the stuff and like they can run your video and put effects on it and like make it explode, you know, like, so just kind of give them depending on what their capabilities are. But the nice thing about having it in Dropbox is you're going to go up to someone, they go, we don't have it. And you're going to go, I'm going to airdrop it to you. I'm going to email it to you. I'm going to something. It's right there. Back in the day, it would be like, I got to call a dude to like send, you know, it just, it wasn't kind of where it needed to be. Right. So have, have all your stuff on you at all times. Have your, your tech writer, any notes, a diagram of the booth, like the stage plot, have all that stuff in your hand, like at all times, just put it on your phone. You know. So you get there earlier in the day. The tech writer's already been sent out, but they fucked it up for sure. You have the tech writer. Are you like reorganizing all of the the turntables? The opener has to play on that. Like yeah, how it depends on like every on turn. DJ gear has sort of standardized a little bit to where if you're playing a hip hop party, you're going to go there, and the majority of the time they're going to be on an S11 or something. The artist, the artist is either going to be using that and everyone's going to open on that, or there's just going to be a second setup. Maybe they're wheeling out another booth. And it's just, you know, some of the particulars, making sure everything. The nice thing about like, like Pioneer DJ Mixers, for example, you can, here's a, here's a tip. Every time you load the firmware for a mixer on your computer, it loads a setting utility. So right now, if you've got like, if you've used an S9, an S7, and an S11, if you go in and search, you've got those utilities there. So you can actually customize all your effects parameters and everything, save it to your computer. When you go to the gig, you plug into the mixer, load your bank, and everything is the way you like it at home, all your preferences. So I go in, I make sure all that's good. Anything that's particular with the artist, like mic setup, levels, how things are run, you know, oh shit, this is wonky. I mean, sometimes you get there and something's broken and I got to sit there all afternoon while they go find another whatever because they got a broken thing and I got to I gotta stay there until it works right or else I got to come back and double check it. So um, yeah, just getting all that like 100% and be like, take a picture of the room sometimes so we kind of know what we're dealing with. Like, Right. And, and if an artist is dedicated to a, a specific brand, uh, are you traveling with that or is that just goes on the writer and it's a must have, like I'm saying if it's something not, this isn't obscure, but like a rain 12, right? It's not obscure, but it's not a, a club standard. It's, you know, it honestly depends on where you're going because obviously U S Canada, London, Japan, a bunch of places. Hey, we need this. They're going to have it. Croatia, Macedonia, Latvia, you know, some, you know, somewhere in South America, middle of nowhere, the more particular your gear gets, it is harder to get gear in so, to some of those countries. So you're either getting, I mean, dude, we've done, we've done gigs where we had companies advanced gear and it was the only one of those in the country. That's and, crazy. Yeah. So like, you know, that's also part of it is confirming the day before the day of it's there, it's there, right? You got the thing. If it's <laughs> going to be problematic and it's like a mixer, we're literally traveling with a mixer, like one person on the team. It's in a case. It might not ever come out, but you get there and it's the only whatever in country and it's broken. Or you get to like, we're doing a beach party and like rental company has all destroyed gear because they do beach parties. And I'm like, yo, this whole thing is like fucked up. Like we, this is not going to work. So I, it's, I just, was... it's problem solving on your feet most of the time. Like even in the middle right. of the show, something goes wrong and I'm like running all over a club and like, you know, whatever, whatever the problem is, dude, dude we started a tour. Uh, we were in Budapest first night of the tour. I'm watching Jeff play. I'm on the side of the stage. Like, you know, usually like we get up and rock in 15 minutes. I text the manager. Yo, we're all set up. It's all good. Jeff's DJing. And I look over and Jeff's going, and I'm like, he's looking at me and he's like, one of his fillings fell out. <laughs> First show of the tour, he like eh, puts it in the thing and like keeps DJing, finishes the set. No one knows. I'm like 
texting the manager, something's wrong. I go over to Jeff. He's like, my fit, I'm hitting her. She's looking for a dentist in the next town. We're going like, okay, I'm in Hungary trying to find, you know, we're on a 6 a.m. flight, like to somewhere else. I don't know. So that's, you know, we got that all sorted out, do this. Sometimes it's the thing that's happened. And this is, you know, I always talk to DJs, like there is a value to being an experienced DJ because you've just had things go wrong so many times. And you're like, oh, the turntable's dead? Cool, I'm going to DJ on one turntable tonight. Who cares? I've done that a dozen times. So other people, it's like, oh God, uh, like... But the phase is godsend. There's no dropped. way I could possibly finish the gig. <laughs> Once phase dropped, it was just like, oh, it was amazing. Yeah. That was, yeah. I mean, even just with turn, I mean, that's another thing. You get to the gig and the turntable is like, meh. And then. That's for the tour managing part and all the stuff you do. But as far as traveling goes, I mean, that's a whole, just adding on. 10,000 more things to it. And we're wondering any travel tips or whatever else you got involves that. You mean tour manager travel tips or general travel tips? All the above. Cause I think they're, they really do wrap yeah. into the same. I mean, it's yeah. The same. Well, okay. Tour so I can tell you like travel guy, number one, um, whoever's the highest ranked person, they'll usually let everyone board together. So if I'm business class and you guys aren't, you can usually all board together, which is very nice. Um, if you're going to be traveling that much, they make memberships that will get you into every lounge. Like it doesn't matter. It's United lounge, Delta lounge. You can buy like this membership and like anywhere you go, let me in the lounge. Um, obviously TSA pre, we talked about all this stuff, global entry coming back in another huge one, especially during the holidays. That's just a, a nightmare. This is a weird one that I'm going to point out. Um, can't nope not working sort of oh almost there almost there oh <laughs> okay so i'll i'll give them a picture to post but um during covid i was traveling a lot during covid which was wild they stopped giving you fruit in your drink they didn't they weren't you know i guess contamination risk and but what they were using was this this is called true lime and this company makes lime, lemon, and orange. I, I don't have like stock in this company, but it's yeah. basically like a dehydrated wedge of lime. Each packet is one wedge and you just pour it in your drink and it's it's like better than actual lime. I don't know. That's weird because it is lime, but like I have in my bag, just a grip of these just to make drinks more delicious on planes. Um, wait, wait, where can you get that? I need to buy that because that would be a great literally thing like a hundred of these are like six dollars on Amazon. I have boxes really? of them because True I'm addicted lime. to sparkling water, so just like put that in there. I love that. <laughs> Yo, like in Coke, amazing. Um, yeah, I mean, that's the other thing is like just be comfortable. We, you know, get everything off your back if you can get bags that roll. That is a huge one because when you got to do like a month on the road, it destroys your back. Um, you know, other, other random thing. If you're a nerd out there, um, two things I bought that I loved. Number one, um, pocket operator, teenage engineering. Do you guys know about these? Well, no, I'm sorry. I was buying true lime. So we got true lime. And then what was the second one? <laughs> okay. Do you want me to go get two things? Yeah, sure. Okay. I'll edit it. We can, Cause we can edit. Watch this. Yeah, yeah. Edit. Technology. Okay. So two things that I just have in my bag that just help me like kill time pocket operator. So this company, this is teenage engineering. They were at NAM. Oh yeah. Love they that. make these little, this has a case on it. So it's actually thicker. This is a sequencer. This is like a drum machine. Yeah. So basically it just has like, it looks like a calculator and it just has all these different patterns I don't know if you guys can hear it. That randomly came up in my Instagram feed today, but I know I'm familiar with teenage engineering. So like, I'm just on a plane, like making beats and shit, super fun. And the other thing I'm going to recommend is <clears throat> Oh, okay. Okay. So this company is Game called, An it's called Anbernick and it looks like a little switch. And I bought it on Amazon. I think it was like a hundred dollars also. 
And I was like, oh, I'm going to load games on here. It's like a dummy switch. No, it came loaded with all the games. Huh. So like different ROMs, like you can just pop the SD card out and load. Like it already had all these games, but if it's missing something now, the crazy thing about playing video games nowadays, if you're younger is when you were a kid and you would play like Castlevania and you died, there was like a code and you had to like write it down. And then you had to like go back up, in up, left, the... right, left, right. Down, yeah. Down. Via, no, via. dude, I would like take a picture of the code because I have a phone now. So now I can like beat video games because it'd be like, all right, we'll just come back to this later. Take a picture of the passcode. Do you have a passcode to restart? And then I'm right back where I was. Yo, like went to New Zealand, just like beat Castlevania too. So anyways, I just occupy yourself. Uh, AeroPress, if you like coffee, I'm a coffee snob. It's a, it's a coffee maker. It's basically like plastic. I'll take that on the road with like a bag of, a bag of coffee. Um, and, uh, and I also try to stay active. So like the travel bands, like I'll take a whole set of like, workout bands to like get busy in my hotel room but that's about it take care of yourself on the road drink a lot of water sleep when you can i mean and the biggest thing is like my homegirl saren's like a big shit tour manager and she's always like every minute you waste right now is a minute you don't sleep so like get done with the show get shit together get back to the hotel the end also don't be the guy who sets nine alarms in the morning so one alarm. <laughs> that, one yeah, alarm. That, that drives me nuts too it's like just I, get up you can look <laughs> it up you don't get any extra sleep because once the first one goes off your brain's basically awake and it's you're just wasting time because yeah. you have to room with someone and they're just like yeah every five minutes your fucking alarm goes off and it's like don't be that guy <laughs> you know? right and that's Zimmy's travel tips right there a lot of good ones on there and then the last bit we do is just the sauce. And the sauce is basically uh, your advice to your future self, your younger self, uh, to, few, uh, to younger DJs, just, you know, the sauce. Like, what's your takeaway from life or all the interviews that you've done or any of that stuff? Mm. So we have one more video. We'll run that, and then we'll come back to DJ Story. <laughs> the unnecessary videos. Okay. Uh, the name is Boots, baby. And, uh... This shout out goes out to Drew and Fuse, all the way from Cincinnati to the LBC bottle. Yeah, I was told you guys are quite the chefs and you got a delicious sauce that you cook up. Ooh, and it drips that swagoo and breaks down the recipe. Yeah, and you giving up the pee. Cause it's funky, as in good that is, finger funkin' good, on the one, by the power of the one. Yeah, without that, there is none. So get yours and be in tune with the one that loves you. Get it, baby. <laughs> I definitely like uh, I definitely like Bootsy. I, I, you know, look, it's your show. But I, for me, I think I would just probably get a couple more videos like that. Just get some interesting person doing an intro. <laughs> Not that the other ones weren't as good as Bootsy, but <laughs> do whatever you want. That, that would be uh, my sauce for the show. Would be that. <laughs> um, ironically, right there. Um, okay, so my sauce. My advice to my future self, my advice to my younger self, my advice to everyone. Okay, so I'm going to plug something in here too. Um, ironically, uh, in April, I am starting the first of hopefully many uh, DJ gatherings, DJ retreats of my own. Um, it's called Level Up, and it'll be in Pittsburgh. Uh, you can go to Level Up for DJs, the number four, and sign up, which I don't know how long till this airs, but... Cause basically like, I think a big part of DJing is also being a functional human. Chris Lighty used to say like he wanted, and I've told this story before he want, he wanted his, his artist to operate from a place of stability because nothing will end your career faster than making decisions from desperation. So I always try to tell people like DJing is, is, is important. DJing is cool. You can have a very successful DJ career. You can, you can have a lot of great life and world experiences in DJing. I mean, DJing has taken me all over the world and I've like done so many amazing things and met, I mean, 
these records up here behind me are all signed. These are all people I've met, people I know personally, people I consider friends, and it's all from DJing. But you also want to make sure you handle your business and take care of yourself. Um, part of the way that I designed the Level Up retreat that I'm putting together is, you know, yeah, DJing, all the stuff, all the new gear, all the new software, all the all the hacks, mental health, financial literacy, investing, all the other stuff. Because everyone watching this right now, you might be killing it as a DJ. Okay, what do you picture 65-year-old you? You know what I mean? Make sure that person is set up and healthy and has saved some money and invested in some other things. Like my boy Nugget and I in Pittsburgh, we always talk about like, man, if we would have known better 20 years ago, instead of blowing every dollar we made on shoes and cheesecake factory and ridiculous shit, I probably would have invested. And, you know, I, I do a lot of other things now, but I just started late. Um, take care of your body. I mean, working in a nightclub, working in somebody, it's not a healthy environment, you know, like just for time schedules and substances and things like that. You know, get in, get into a, an exercise regimen early and just try to maintain that. Um, take care of your, take care of your brain. You know what I mean? There's a really great documentary, um, out there called, if you just look up DJ depression documentary, it's like 45 minutes long and it's got like Seth Troxler in it and a bunch of people, but it talks about like DJing's crazy because you're like the man or the woman for like Why two we hours DJ? Or four hours. What's it called? Why why we DJ? Why we DJ? And then it's like, you know, Seth Troxler is like, I'm on my way to a gig and I'm breaking up with my girlfriend in the car on the way to the gig. And no one at the club cares about that. They want they're paying me to be the party guy. And then I go home and I get I get out of the club and I'm in the hotel room by myself and no one's around and no one speaks the language and like all that. So, you know, DJing and life is like a lot of ups and downs. So just kind of the more you the more you arm yourself to be able to handle all that stuff financially, mentally, physically, the longer you'll be in the game. And also, um, and this is probably the biggest one. It's like so much of this is just relationship based. You know, I still meet young people who think like I'm going to make it. And they're like trying 150 percent and they ignore the little subtleties of like human interaction and social cues and like being a nice person and being being professional and responding to emails in a timely fashion and like tone and all these things that are way more important. You know, I can get anybody to DJ. There's a, I can't throw a rock and not hit a fucking DJ. I need someone that's going to be there on time and professional. And also I like dealing with, you know, like we were talking right. about Kilmore from Incubus earlier. We can, we can get into him, but like being on tour is a good example from that. We can get anyone to play guitar. We have to like being with you for a month at a time and right. like, the same way like yo we can you guys can get anyone on this podcast it's like do we want to talk to you for two hours like are you going to get on our nerves do we like you like and it's the same thing with business like i'll hire a slightly worse dj if i like hanging out with you or you're not just an asshole you know what i mean like it's not you know so just all that stuff just just be chill just be easy to work with have your shit together be professional know your role know when you're the opener but when you're not, dude, I've done gigs where the, the, the openers heart hands in it and playing like the biggest records and like the, even the promoters like, and I'm like, yeah, man's is kind of on one right now. Like just, just kind of be humble. You know, that's it. It's just all the basic stuff that kind of applies to everything also applies to DJing. I don't know. I love it. I'm, I'm excited to, to learn a little more about this. I think it's interesting. And I think this is something that all the conferences that I've gone to, have lacked in general is what you're talking about. And <laughs> I've been to a couple. <laughs> me, yeah. Yeah. That makes me very excited because that's something that I've been saying for the longest time that really it's all the things that you just mentioned that I think are very necessary for people to hear. Well, and, and little, little backstory, like the people don't know. Yes. I work for pioneer DJ. I, you know, alpha theta, I work in artist relations. That's my part-time job. My day job, I work for a company out of New York called Humble Riot. And Humble Riot and Demby, Aunt Demby and Melody were the people behind the playlist retreat at Jazzy Jeff's house. So I, during my day job, I 
you know, we do experience design and we do, we do cultural campaigns for brands. So I'm very familiar with trying to make things impactful that aren't just like transactional. I want people to come feel like they're becoming part of a community, make some friends. Yeah. Learn some shit that's going to help you DJ, but learn some shit that's going to help you when you're not DJing, because even if you're DJing all the time, you're DJing for like 15 hours a week. You know what I mean? Like there's a lot of other hours in there where you have to like be a functioning uh, adult human being in society. So is, is this going to be once a year or is this uh, all the time in an ideal scenario? Um, this will happen every spring in Pittsburgh. And then I'd like to have a fall one that moves around the country to different markets, because part of the way I'm designing this is I want you to feel like you're coming to summer camp or, or whatever, you know, whatever camp. And I want you to go out and experience the city, right? Like talking about the tour manager thing. I was in Sydney, Australia. I think it wasn't until the fourth time I was there that I didn't see anything other than the hotel and the pancake restaurant in the lobby because that's just how touring works. So I want people to come to this retreat and leave going, yo, I ate all the Pittsburgh food and I saw all the Pittsburgh shit and whatever. And then when we do it in Austin and we do it in Chicago, you know, cause, cause the other thing is me and you guys, we have a certain level of access. We travel around a little bit We're we, you know, we go places and we get kind of hooked up. I want people that come to this that like have never really gone outside their city or have never been to some of these places. I want them to feel like, okay, I got a proper tour. And now I can say like, I went to Atlanta and I know what's going on versus like, I went from the airport to the thing, to the airport. And I went home. I want you to be like, yo, I ate the, the lemon pepper wings that I'm supposed to eat. And I went to the Stankonia, like, you know, like you want people to feel like they did the thing. So for me, that's just as impactful as, Here's a trick to organize your crates. You know what I mean? Great. Yeah, no, it's more cool. impactful. I, I love, yeah. I love, love, love this. It's amazing. Yeah. So, like, yeah. here's a friend. There you go. You just made a friend. How how great is that? Versus, you know, let's all sit in a boring conference room. So, uh, no, I love it. I'm I'm excited to talk a little more about that uh, off camera. I think that's there's some there's some really cool things there, and yeah, um, I think. The, the, there's tons of opportunity there for people and um and growth within yourself is is important and to, to never we're living in a very that. interesting time like because because it's not hard to find people i mean some of the programming that i'm working on i'm really excited about but it's not hard to find people who have really great stories about like how they got their shit together how they started going to therapy or how they took control of aspects of their life and how you know we're at an age where like, I don't drink, I've never drank. But every time I tell someone that they ask me how long I've been clean, how long I've been sober. Because so many DJs of our age have already gone way off the rails and gotten clean. Yeah. Excuse me. So hearing the stories about when I did this, every, my life and my work and my relationships improved. Those are the kind of stories. And those are the kind of discussions where people can go back and go, yo, I'm struggling with performance anxiety. How do I get a hold of this so I can keep advancing my career? Or there's things I want to do, but I'm like too nervous to right now. Like, cool, let's talk about that. I don't have all the answers, but like, I'll put you in the room with people who you can be like, yo, I got a question. That's it. Right. You know? Right. Yeah. It's super important. It's super, we live in a, and our worlds revolve around, you know, such unhealthy habits. And if you're DJing five nights a week, you're in a bar five nights a week, there's alcohol accessible five times a week. And let it's, I always tell people, I'm like, it is not normal to drink five nights a week. And then especially where it's like, Oh, I just had eight drinks. I didn't drink that much tonight. You know, it's yeah. like, that's not normal, dude. Drinking eight drinks is, it, it is so bad for you. And so many people don't realize how good they can feel because they just feel so bad all the time. And they're normalized by that. Well, and, and we also work in a field, unfortunately, that there's a lot of external pressure, right? There's external pressure to, like you said, yo, yo, the stories I have from people that are like, I'll give you a quick one. My man, we'll, we'll just keep it anonymous. It's like, yo, I'm trying to get booked in Vegas. I go to Vegas. I'm at the club. Owner comes over. 
I don't really feel like drinking that night, but the owner wants to rip shots. So here I am ripping shots. Yo, we're going out afterwards. I don't really want to go out afterwards, but I'm trying to get booked again. So I'm going out afterwards. Yo, we're at the strip club. I don't really want to be at the strip club, but the owner's like, yo, we're going to the strip club. The owner starts blowing cocaine. I don't really want to do that. I also want to get booked again. Then we leave the strip club with a bunch of strippers. He goes, so now we're back at the suite. And there's, he's like, it's just, it's just a whole bunch of shit. I didn't want to do the next morning. They send the car for me and the owner's like, oh my God, best time ever. We're going to do this every month. Oh, man's uh, is getting booked every month now, but he knows going in there, I'm going to have to A, B, C, D or else there, you know, a back to right. back to the, back to the, I want to book, you know, you know, uh, be, just be a cool person, you know, just understanding your relationships, but also know when to go. I don't want to do that, man. I want to just play your club. And sometimes you're going to take an L on that gig, but you got away. Like, you know what I mean? So we, we work in a, in an industry where the pressure to partake in substances, the pressure to, I mean, even to play music that you don't like, that just, that just like you get home at night and you're like, what am I doing? Yeah. You know, like so many things about the people you interact with in some of these nightclubs are so toxic. They're terrible humans. It's like a terrible human party sometimes. And you got to like talk to the guy who's like racist and crazy and like all this stuff. And it's like all that seeps into you. And then you got to spend the rest of your time going, okay, I need to like not drink tonight and I'm going to hang out with my friend and we're going to exercise. Like you got to like undo that. And that's really the conversation. But also a lot of people aren't confident enough to say, I don't want to do that. Or I don't want to burn this bridge and not get this gig and screw up my career. And there's always more gigs. Yeah, you know, you just try to tell that to a young person, like, yo, you live in Iowa and there's like one club in your town. It's like you don't want to burn that bridge, but it's like, how do you have a conversation where it's like, yo, man, I want to come in here and DJ. I don't want to blow coke off with a bottle service girl every weekend. Like, this is crazy, <laughs> you know? <Right>. Like, yeah. <laughs> seriously. So it's just, you know, there's a life outside of DJing and it all fits together. And you know, right. Yeah. So um that's awesome. I love it. I look, I look forward to, to talking more about that and hearing more about that. Um, do we want to circle back around to a crazy DJ story or is that it? Is that all we got for the day? We're, we, we'll just cut it. I think you already told some great stories and we'll just yeah. run into, just let me tell, let me tell. Cause we were talking about Kilmore before. If you guys can't see up here, this is a incubus science record. And, uh, fuse was talking about, being a big fan of, of incubus and um one of the cool things about my job uh is i have gotten to meet just a bunch of djs that i mean yeah like heroes right to meet you know so um got connected with kilmore through pioneer um we're working on some products so so part of my job is product development so if you guys don't know what that means like i helped design the s11 i mean obviously a bunch of other people and engineers and people way smarter than me worked on that but you know i get to submit product feedback and like what do you think about this menu and these buttons and just all that stuff so i got to work a lot on that and the rev7 and the s7 and the cross 12 so when we started working on the cross 12s i got to work with uh kilmore from incubus which i'm a og like rock nerd like in the 90s i was like rock and metal and we got like smashing pumpkins right here and some other you know this is z trip and djp right here yeah. so you know we we I, I go over to kilmore's house and like there is a saying like don't meet your heroes like sometimes you definitely meet someone and you're like oh no you ruined it for me like i've definitely had that happen a couple times but you know nicest dude ever just like super just super mellow um super cool you know we did an interview for for the documentary project and it was really really great and really interesting but um watching and then so then so then he came to um ohio which i'm in i'm in pittsburgh so it was a quick drive and i got to see how he performed which is crazy so like we all know how to use like serato and cue points and things like that but watching so if you if you go online and you look up like a picture of kilmore set up on 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 stage he's got his dj set up and then under it he's got a bunch of keyboards and to the side he's got keyboards and drum machines and like all this shit. and then under that he's got a bunch of foot pedals so the wild shit is he's playing keys and he's got songs where like the cue points are hitting like 
backing vocals and ambient noises and like like he went to school i think to be like foley to like do sound design for like movies so he's like eh, nah, 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 and like his feet are like hitting stuff and sort like i'm watching the shit and then he's cutting stuff in and then going to other parts in the song with his feet so like you know battle history like he came up on the east coast battling and went to la and was battling but also just like watching that dude and how he kind of like music directs uh, the show a little bit and perform. And also just like most gracious human, like he came to Pittsburgh and uh, my buddy, you know, his kid wanted to go. So I was like, yo man, can my man bring his kid? I think his kid's like eight years old or something. And I ruined his son for every concert he will ever go to. <laughs> like, got there. Kim was like, sup buddy. Like, put him on the side stage. He's like losing his oh mind, gets a That's poster awesome. signed by the whole band, like gets him all the stuff. He's like taking pictures with everyone, you know, but he was just like, wasn't weird at all about was just like, hell yeah, this dude's rocking. Like, I love it. So like, yeah, just one of those experiences where like we chat all the time. He's always like really trying to push the boundaries with technology. So I'm always like, yeah, let me see if I can like figure that out. So, um, just, you know, if you're not an incubus fan and that, and we talked to in the interview about like, you know, Battlestar Scratch Lactica on the Make Yourself album, which is a, a cut track with Cut Chemist and Newmark. The amount of like people that have told him like, yo, I'm a rock dude and this shit got me into DJing or that shit got me into hip hop or that shit got me into turntablism. So like, you know, just those important moments, like back to documentary stuff that I think like really help fill out the story of, you know, DJing. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. It's a great yeah. one. Uh, I think that's pretty much going to wrap up. So before we, we jump off here, if you just kind of want to uh, mention where everybody can find you, any of the links you want to promote one more time, all that good stuff. Okay. Uh, another sauce tip, another pro tip. Uh, yeah. Do all that stuff at the beginning of the interview, just in case someone yeah. doesn't make it to <laughs> the 90 minute mark of our absurdity. Um, yeah. You DJ Zimmy Z I M M I E. You can find me on Instagram. I apologize in advance if whatever I post on Instagram is ridiculous for you. Um, I have a record label, Private Stock Records. Boop. Um, we are on socials, PVT, Stock, R-E-C-S, PrivateStockRecords.com. Um, we do 7-inch vinyl, 12-inch um, vinyl, DJ edits, all kinds of stuff. Excuse me. Um, level Up for DJs is the retreat. And the DJ documentary.com is uh, your site for all things for the upcoming project. Yeah. And I, and I try to be very accessible. If you need something, hit me up. If you have a question about some, hit me up, you know, uh, that, I'm, that, I'm at like a point in my career where I very much enjoy helping people. Uh, you know, especially if you're doing the first couple steps yourself and you hit a wall, you know, when people go, Hey man, can you do the thing for me? Not, not that interested in that, but, um, yeah. That that project, the Fifty Years of Hip Hop, the Pioneer um, collab, is that going to be on streaming services, or is that just like a website they're going to pay? Or so that is specifically for Pioneer. So those three episodes will live on Pioneer's YouTube. There'll be like okay. teasers that come out for each episode. So we should have the first one up before the end of February. It's February right now, um, and then just keep trucking on the bigger one. Like I said, we've just haven't had, uh, much luck getting a streaming service to pick up the full documentary project. So if anybody out there is watching knows a guy or your uncle's famous or whatever, call your boy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, love it. All right. Well, thanks for taking the time to be on here with us today. We appreciate it so much. And thank you guys. Uh, there's a lot of good information in this episode and I had a, a great time chatting. So, <laughs> Yeah, thank you guys. Um, and uh, yeah, don't be strangers. <laughs> and go find Mr. Gibbs just... in Cincinnati. Yeah, I know. I need to. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -uh. All right. That's going to wrap up the show for today. Until next time, we'll see you guys later. Peace. Peace. <laughs>